Hey guys, Pinky Gonzalez here. Welcome back to New School VR. This is the third show, and today we're going to be interviewing Nathaniel Andrini. This is also going to be a unique show, even for the New School VR podcast itself, and even though we're so new, uh, Nathaniel does not come from a VR background. He's not a technologist. He's not an engineer. He's not a 3D designer. He is a community educator. We met recently at a social gathering in Portland and got to talking about what we're doing here with the New School podcast and what he has done all over the world, as you'll hear in just a moment, with community education, why he does that, how he does that, and the role of interconnectivity in that process. I felt like it was an important uh, opportunity. It's an important subject. And it, it, with things being so new in the VR space right now, with so many programs and experiences and environments yet to make, when we think about the potential of VR in, in the learning experience, we tend to think, how can I make learning fun like a game? And that's fine. We'll, we'll have lots of time to talk about that approach. When we talk about empathy, the ability to better understand through personal experience, that's a different ballgame. It's challenging because we don't know what we don't know yet in this space. We have to invent the best practices and, uh, and the killer apps, so to speak. So we don't quite know what the right experience is going to be. But I think what you'll hear from Nathaniel is the why. Why? It's important that we better understand each other and then the how. How has he, through workshops and otherwise, helped uh, help people, primarily students, um, but of all, all ages, uh, better understand their, their classmates, their community, and even themselves through social, uh, sort of guided social experiences that I think we can take some lessons from and apply in virtual and augmented space. So with that in mind, I hope you enjoy the interview. Nathaniel is a brilliant, wonderful person. Um, all of the links that, uh, all of the names and, and uh, links to various websites that he mentions in the interview are now available, if you're hearing this, on uh, newschoolvr.com under uh, the, the specific show uh, section. So with that, let's get into it. Welcome to a show about learning technologies so powerful they transcend the boundaries of reality itself. I'm your host, Pinky Gonzalez, and this is New School VR. Hey everybody, welcome back to New School VR. Uh, with us today in the studio, or the virtual studio, uh, I'm here at Concordia University, and Nathaniel Andrini is joining us via Skype. Welcome to the show, Nathaniel. Good morning. How you doing, man? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. So we we uh, we met in uh, kind of classic fashion. We were at a party. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, discussing the arts, and uh, I was uh, more or less blown away by your global background. You have uh, highly international uh, history with the arts and education and beyond. Uh, t tell us where it started. Where, where did all this uh, begin for you? Where did my international or my interest in international and other cultures begin? The whole deal. Yes. The whole the, deal. It, yeah. But like, let's, let's start in like high oh, school. Where, how, how does one even begin on a trajectory like yours? Yeah, that's a good, that's, that, that's, Definitely, okay, rooted in where I'm from. I, I grew up in a really integrated, multicultural part of the Bay Area in California, just south of San Francisco in a little suburb, well, the next county south of San Francisco called San Mateo. Mm -hmm. And in San Mateo, at that time, uh, through skateboarding and punk rock and uh, hip hop, which was just kind of entering the the skate skateboarding scene in the early to mid 80s um this this blending of cultures was also a blending of i mean a blending of subcultures was also a super blending of 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 ethnic cultures and uh different people and perspectives coming together around uh around skateboarding and other other uh and music basically mm -hmm. and through this um 
uh, just really ingrained in me an interest and respect for the for otherness. And I think this this is like a key part of like of who I am at the core as somebody who not just as as a caring sort of empathetic interest, but but a deep curiosity in well, just what it means to be alive from different perspectives. So it really began uh, just a, a luck, the luck of the draw growing up in a place as awesome as, um, and, and getting to know other people through, through the active sport of skateboarding and going to shows and meeting strangers and finding myself in all kinds of different, uh, scenarios. And it, it's, it was just a cool, cool time. So that, that really sparked an interest in, um, in travel as I got older and, um, Let's see. Yeah, well, I'll stop there for now. That's that's where it started. Cool. Okay. So yeah. so uh, where where'd you go to college? What was the next step? Actually, the next step, um, I, I I'd have to backtrack a bit because I I had a pretty circuitous academic background. You know, I mm-hmm. I started as most people do with elementary school and junior high and then high school, but then I took this massive break after high school and, and went um, about, let's see, eight years before I went into undergrad. Mm. And in that time, I uh, lived in Paris for, it was my first trip abroad, actually. I bought a one-way ticket. <laughs> wow, nice. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, I was enrolled in the local community college at the time. Uh, let's see, it's called... Uh, CSM, Community College of San Mateo. And I was there just taking general ed courses um, after high school, not seriously, just, you know, two or three per semester and working odd jobs. And uh, I'm one of my friends, another skater kid, had disappeared for a while. And then he came back after six months. I was like, dude, where were you? He's like, oh, I was in London, the study abroad program. I was like, study abroad? What's that? I had no idea. I was 20 years old and I had no clue what study abroad was. He told me all about it. (laughs) And literally the day, that day I went directly to the study abroad office, signed up for the next trip, which happened to be Paris. Like it was leaving in uh, one month. All I had to do is cough up um, enough money to get a ticket Hmm. and off I went. And you know, one month later, I was on a on a plane, and uh, I stayed there for about six months. Totally bagged the the um, the classes. I used I cut <laughs> cut every class. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> and just uh, skated around Paris, ate crepes, went to <laughs> you know checked out different shows, and oh, had the best time of my life. Wow. And I came back when I ran out of money six months later. <laughs> failed, failed every course. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a good start to a, 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 a highly a, a acclaimed academic career. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Not so, a lot of people know that. I love that. That so when when did you get serious about school? Was that that the 8 years later? Yeah, 8 years later. So after that Paris trip, I came back and worked odd jobs, moved around a bit. I lived in uh in uh Seattle for a few years. And I started picking up photography, and I was self-taught and um, ran my own dark rooms. And so this is pre-digital. Mm-hmm. And uh, from there, and I wasn't serious about it in the ter- in the way that I became serious about it academically later. I was just into the science of it, shooting and developing, and printing, and, and just looking. It was less about ex- exhibitions and getting my name out there as it was way more about the experience and that just that again that deep curiosity um of others because i was shooting mostly people had that thread had started as a kid and really came through with my photography um and i went to boston for a while and then i moved to portland oregon this is all in like a five-year period and it was in portland this is now eight years forward um, I discovered the local art school here, uh, Pacific Northwest College of Art, PNCA, mm-hmm. 
I totally randomly went in. I met some girl at Fred Meyer, <laughs> and she was like, hey, you like photography. Let's go to this exhibition at PNCA. And I was like, oh, what's that? And she, oh, I'll take you. So she, we went on a date, kind of a date. And, uh, and she, she didn't know it was a date. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, I didn't know it was a date. <laughs> nice. I, she asked me out. And I was like, yeah, cool, a new friend. Anyway, <laughs> she took me to PNCA, and, um, and I, it was there standing in the commons in, uh, in the old building, which is now torn down on Northwest Johnson mm-hmm. in 12, uh, that I said to myself, huh, art school. Yeah, that could be interesting. And I, I applied, and a year later I started. Wow. So what yeah. was your, your focus while you were there? It was initially print, uh, sorry, it was initially photography, mm-hmm. but at that point the digital switch had happened and I was less interested, and I, and I really missed the, um, the hands-on, uh, and the, uh, the deeper sort of like chemical and scientific uh, um, experience of photography. So I switched to printmaking in my after my first year there because printmaking is so um determinant on technique and um and and work like (laughs) it's it takes work to create a print rather than just a snap you know right yeah so i got into that and uh four years later as i was doing my thesis i had already kind of uh gravitated through printmaking and into performance work this is totally uh sounds tangential but for me it was it was again like just trying to get deeper and deeper into ideas and and various ways of of performing those ideas or executing those ideas and my thesis really turned into this multimedia installation sculpture photography printmaking and performance based work this wow. whole whole series of work that I did. Hmm. Culmination of life. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds absolutely fascinating. Does any of that live live online today or is it a was it a, a, a passing moment in time? Yeah, some of it does live on online. Yeah, I did a I have a Vimeo channel which I can share later um, with a few a few videos on it. Great. We can uh, link to that in the show notes on the website. That'd be great. So from there, you, you move on to uh, the Teachers College at Columbia. What, what was that experience like? Well, just uh, before I jump into that, I, I have to just state that another seven years went by. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love before, it. Before I decided on a master's. And uh, in that time, I lived in Japan for a few years teaching English and um, cultural studies in high school and junior high and um, moved, kept moving around a bit and then land, landed in New York to go to, to, go to school. And, and um, I, I have to back, just has to backtrack to, 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 to qualify why I went to ma- my master's program. Yeah, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a natural progression after art school. Not at all. In fact, most of my Classmates in art school, after art school, went directly into their MFA um, programs because it, around the same time our economy was tanking. Oh uh, yeah. So it's between 2005 and 2008 um, that classmates basically left school in 05, entered an MFA program, and graduated just as the economy tanked. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, it was crazy. Mm. And in that time. I sort of luckily dodged that particular particular bullet only to end up in the situation I ended up in later, but um, went abroad to Japan the same year that Obama was elected mm-hmm. and and basically was gone for most of his entire term. Wow. Huh. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, I was in Japan, then New York just for the two years of master's, then went abroad again for two years, and now I'm back just as Trump is getting elected. <laughs> Beautiful. Good. <laughs> Good one, man. You did it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, I don't mean to uh, no. <laughs> sideline your question Qu- here. Quite all right. Quite all right. So I was in Japan three years, 
09 through 12 to through 2012 and in 2011 in March is when the giant earthquake mm. and tsunami and whole Fukushima meltdown happened. Yeah. And uh I was living just north of there. Just an uh the way the crow flies, if you could fly on a plane, it would take an uh 40 minutes. So it wasn't far. We felt the earthquake where we were. There was a smaller tsunami. It didn't didn't hurt anybody or wipe out any homes near us. But um, the devastation that we we witnessed, and by we I mean just within the country of Japan, um, was so profound and 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 it, it really was a pivot point for me as an artist and educator. It was this question what can I do? What am I doing? And what can I do to better serve my audience after like within this, this completely devastated place. And at the time I was questioning myself was when I was also, you know, simultaneously watching the country respond to the disaster. And I was struck by, um, as an American, specifically as an American, where disasters happen all over our country constantly, you know? Uh, Katrina had just happened recently. Um, you know, Hurricane Sandy was later, which I also I moved to New York just at the time when that, literally a month before Sandy happened and was affected by that. Wow. But watching the, the national response in Japan, it's a collective, it's a more of a collective-based uh, culture as it is. So the response is, it's really felt from north to south, no matter where you live, there is a deep empathy and care for what happens in your country. Having been living there for two years already before the disaster, I had started to, to integrate those feelings into my understanding of, of culture. And my culture was adapting to that. So I too felt this, this, deeper connection and empathy toward what was happening there. Hmm. So I asked myself, and this is, this leads to the, the, I mean, this answers the question, why did I go to grad school? It's a question that I had asked myself was, um, what, what does a longer range, um, response to this disaster look like? Meaning, yes, I could just hop on a bus and go down there and start volunteering cleaning up debris, feeding and feeding, feeding and giving shelter, et cetera. Um, but what would it look like in a longer term sense? And that's, and grad school came in, um, to the picture because I felt like there was, there are deeper connections, uh, deeper questions that I had that needed time to suss out mm. and focus time. So, um, while I did go down, and volunteer a few times and get really involved in um, what was happening in the in the disaster zone. I also was at the same time, like concurrently teaching my younger students the importance of, especially just the the importance of learning English at a time like this when the country is inundated with international volunteers. And in Japan, I'm not sure if you know, but the 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 level of English uh, functional usage of English is quite low hmm. uh, for most people. So here's a country who needs help and it needs organization and um, coordination of, ver of various NGOs and people from various countries, all using English as the lingua franca to help uh, volunteer in the in, in the zone. Um, so it's so it's teaching and and sort of. Uh, pushing this like uh, interest and spirit of volunteerism and um, and English functional English to my junior high school kids specifically because that's around the time that in Japan that uh, students are starting to treat English as an academic subject more than a functional subject. Uh -huh. Interesting. So that's that's what I wanted to get out, and then yeah, I found myself in uh, a master's program in international education 
at Teachers College and working with uh, a professor whose focus is on families and communities. So it was like this, um, you know, looking at my looking back on the this the school that I chose and the major within that school. So the school is highly renowned and and known throughout the world, um, and that's one reason why I chose it. But I but then I which is sort of the macro view. And then on the micro view, I chose family and community as the, the root, the sort of where things begin. Um, and, and really like that juxtaposition. I was attracted to that. Yeah, I can see why. Did yeah. you continue uh, your explorations in art throughout this period? I did, yeah. I found a way to, to loop it back in. In fact, I had taken a pretty sweet little hiatus from from art while I was in Japan, really having just questioned audience and who I am and what what is it that I, what's, what purpose do I serve in, a, in this other country um, as an artist? So I, I actually just stopped. And when I got to New York, um, I focused a lot more on curating. Um, I was looking more at the artist's response to the disaster and what were artists doing in Japan, uh, and and specifically, a lot of uh, performative works were had arisen. Almost this hybridization between protest and art, which for Americans is uh, or Western cultures not so new, but for Japan it was. Mm. And that really fascinated me. And that that's that's what I focused on. Artists go beyond disaster relief by really doing. Uh, meaningful projects that that aren't they, they they're not just responses mm. to they're not personal responses to the devastation it's more like and I, and I don't mean they're not personal in the sense that they're not for themselves they're for others mm. um, so there's this this um, transference of care can you give us an example of of one of those um, exhibitions or yeah one performance that really uh, struck me and still to this day is I'm finding relevant in, in different contexts too is by an artist named Tsubasa Kato and Kato-san is a uh, he, he really interesting guy uh, one of his first projects after the tsunami was um, he went to this he, he's a Tokyo based artist and he he went up to the the disaster zone, this whole Fukushima area, and where uh, a lighthouse had been washed away by the tsunami, he went to this community where that had happened. Very small, like uh, you know, three to five thousand people in the community. Very few survivors, mostly um, kids who lost their their elders, you know or uh, wives who lost their husbands who were at work that day, or whatever it was. There's just this ragtag group of, of survivors left. And um, Subasa went up there, interviewed members of the community, and found out that this lighthouse had been, dis um, had been washed away. And, so, and that this lighthouse was kind of a reference point for most of the community. This is, this is our beloved lighthouse is gone. So what he did was he reconstructed the entire lighthouse and uh, to to scale, uh, which is in and of itself uh, took a, it was a community effort to to reconstruct it. But he he had his project is called the pull and raise. So just if you can imagine, he reconstructed the lighthouse as it's laying on its side, hmm. and then affixes pulleys and ropes to it. And as a community, they hundreds of people pulling on ropes to literally erect this thing back up to its original state. Wow! And that's the project, pull and raise. So he goes around. He went around different communities and and did other iterations of this. Wow! Pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. that's that's extraordinary. So what really caught my my attention uh, after our initial conversation was the work that you've done with the Open Space Performing Arts program. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So Open Space Performing Arts, OSPA, we'll call it, 
or the acronym, um, is a project that I began in Slovenia where I was living after my master's program. Uh, and it was really in response to with a few things. The main one was that the first year I was living there, um, I was a resident educator in a small museum. And in that museum, uh, I was connecting with a lot of teachers who were bringing their students through the, through the space. And through one of these teacher contacts, I found out about in the local news, uh, in an elementary school, there was a, um, a group of Slovenian kids who had beat up and killed a Bosnian. And so this, as bullying is a, obviously a, 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 an important subject in any country, having just come out of my master's program, I thought, oh man, this is happening here too? Wow. Uh, what, again, what can, what can I do? <laughs> I'm an educator, I'm an artist, I've got interests in... Um, uh, healing in various forms, what can I do in response to this? And uh, OSPA really grew out of this this um, this idea to, of intervening within um, cl- classic systems, our, our system of, of education, conventional systems. Uh, I started developing workshops where I'd go into schools, work, working with teachers, to allow me to come in and completely disrupt the normal flow of the day. And, um, and uh, they started out as these nonviolence workshops. Um, going in, I paired up with a psychotherapist and friend of mine who is also an artist. And the two of us designed these workshops where we, working with younger junior high school kids around uh, sixth grade, so what is that, 12, 12 years old, and late stage elementary uh, students. So like also 10, 10 to 13 was the range we were working with. Uh, and this, these two drawing exercises really induce difference. They induce, uh, it doesn't induce togetherness. We're trying to, to create a disruption, working in pairs and showing that um, that we don't know each other. We already don't know each other. We think we know our friends. We think we know our loved ones. But if we sit down and really look, um, what do we see, and how does and how do we how does what we see get transferred into language, and what's lost along the way? Hmm. You know. And so these drawing exercises really pulled this through the experience pulled. Or in, I just say that it induced a sense of difference even between best friends. What was the actual um, the exercise? Craft? Yeah. Uh-huh. So it started. There's two. Uh, the first one, it's a two-step or two-part workshop. Um, the first one is we have we get the kids to choose a pair. So they're working with their friend, and they sit back to back. And you've probably heard of this. It's kind of a common. A somewhat common exercise. One of the kids is holding an item, a secret item, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Like we we give it to them. Maybe it's like a watch band or a, a, a iPhone cord or something, like a headphones. And the other kid doesn't know what it is. Who's sitting behind them, back to back. And that the kid who's holding the the item has to describe what it is without saying what it is. For example, it's. Long and really thin, and there's uh, the long part is is circular, and on each end there's a, 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 a round, stubby piece with a hole in it. You know, it's this kind of thing. <laughs> and as that as the description comes, the the other kid is drawing what they hear, mm-hmm. and. And this takes about 10 minutes. And there's a lot of laughter. It's crazy because no one really can. I mean, how often do we sit and really describe what it is that we are common everyday items? Mm -hmm. We don't. 
We just accept them as they are. So that's that's hard in and of itself to describe your your surroundings. But the person drawing also has the <laughs> the uh, the burden of trying to 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 draw it out. And and it's always interesting to show. So once we start comparing the description with the drawing, it's it's literally. And I've been doing this for years, and I've done it with hundreds of kids. I would say one or two times it's been accurate. The drawing has been accurate. <laughs> wow. I love so that. So that's, that's a fun one. Yeah. So obviously the person who is describing the object, they can't see what's being drawn either, right? No, no. So they're not helping them along at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I can see that being a lot of fun and, and interesting. What What's the outcome from that? What What are you hoping to see and, and when do you know if it worked? Well, just... That the when the that, that question is more answered at the end of the second workshop. So this in the second workshop we turn the chairs so they're facing each other, and without looking, and they're both holding a, a, a pen and a drawing board with a blank piece of paper on top, and they're facing each other, looking at each other's faces, but they're neither of them are allowed to look down at their own drawing. And so very slowly, and we give them 10 minutes, 10 full minutes to try to draw in detail without looking at your page, the person's face in front of you. And these are also super hilarious. But there's an intimacy in the action, the action of look, deep looking. And it's, it's really intimate and, and embarrassing um, and, and tender and confrontational, and the and that's the experience that I think, after having sat back to back, there's just um, there's a real uh, uh, kind of a zooming in on your partner, whoever that partner is, boy or girl, friend or foe. There's this uh, I think by taking away and then this I, I like this like taking away and then and then putting it back in. So taking away is the back to back and then putting back in focus is face to face. And so the workshops are about the experience and they're also about the outcome and the outcomes are those drawings. Hmm. Um, so how do I know it works? A lot of this is really based on the kind of conversation that Tina and I, my partner in this, Tina and I facilitated throughout so we're talking about difference. We're talking about racism. We're talking about what, is it, what does it mean to not know and why does that drive us to be violent? And we're, we're facilitating conversations about these things as the kids are doing the drawings. Hmm. And, um, and then it's, it wraps up in the end. It's about a four hour, three to four hour workshop. And at the very end, we, um, we ask a lot of questions and we kind of crowdsource various answers about um, ideas of love and hate. And very rudimentary, because we're working with kids here, and the last thing we want to do is just come in and lecture them about what it is they should or should not think. Mm -hmm. So it's really like trying to extract, um, extract what's inside them, but then also, I don't know, sort of curate those moments a little bit too. I think that's really profound stuff. Uh, my ulterior motive or my my uh, my interest in having you on the show, even though we're not talking specifically about virtual reality or augmented or mixed reality, is of the of all of the things that all of the experts in all of the these uh, new industries in in virtual and augmented, uh, uh, both hardware, software, and experiential design, talk about is the potential in education mm -hmm. and its ability to inspire or incite empathy. And that empathy, I, I think the conversation really started with a, uh, a short documentary, I think it's about 12 minutes long, called Clouds Over Sidra. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it follows the, the plight of a family that is in a refugee camp, uh, having fled the, uh, the atrocious war going on in Syria. Mm -hmm. And it was so impactful uh, because I think on one hand, there's still the novelty of VR. Most people had not 
ever had a, uh, an experience where you put on a headset and you can look to your left and your right and up and down. And mm -hmm. as you're hearing the story narrated, you're, you really are there. I mean, you can, you can really see it. Um, however, I think there's a, a, a much deeper level yet to explore. And it's really the live interpersonal potential of, of these technologies. Um, mm -hmm. The in the last interview with uh, uh, Paul Reynolds, formerly of, of uh, Magic Leap and now with Ver Vertex Labs, um, we talked a little bit about a, uh, a YouTube video where there's a, a student who's learning calculus and he's using a painting program called Tilt Brush to just scratch out um, formulas, math, you know, formulas, just as he would on a whiteboard. There was there was no additional calculation going on or computer assistance in in what was going on. He was just using this artistic tool in mm -hmm. order to um, to work through numbers. <laughs> and uh, the coolest thing was that his professor was able to be in that space with him and they could have full conversation around this. So as you describe these interpersonal um, uh, exercises, I really think all of us in this industry should be thinking about um, real world human interactions, ways where if, if we're serious about empathy, we're really looking beyond just storytelling or um, I'm in a documentary about somebody's life, therefore I'm having a, a more personal experience with it than I would if I was you know, in a movie theater or, or watching this online or whatever. Um, did you, are, are there other forms of uh, workshops and, and uh, uh, activities you did with these kids and, and others? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, the, these nonviolence workshops is, is where the seeds for OSPA really began. Um, and OSPA grew out of these. Uh, later that year, I, de I developed a, a program targeting um, uh, teen, teen girls. This is all, uh, again, like trying to give voice to those who, who don't really have one in the specific communities that I was working in within Slovenia. It's uh, still quite a, a masculine-based society. And um, I was curious about what are girls' perspectives, and not only just girls, but girls who come from um, these other parts of the Balkans who, who have, whose parents and grandparents have settled in Slovenia who might be from uh, f countries that were part of Yugoslavia beforehand, before the independence. So Serbian, Bosnian, Macedonian, etc. And so working with um, a youth association to find and find these communities and and, and find uh, interested girls in our program, we 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 ran a pilot that in 2015. And what it was was uh, it's, it's OSPA's at its heart an experiential arts program, and uh, that really focuses and tries to cultivate a sense of social and emotional intelligence, um, cross-cultural skills, and team building. And uh, the methods that I, I really worked with are inquiry-based. So um, it's all about eliciting participant responses to questions that, that, that the program asks. And through our program, we really focused on identity, culture, and what what home means? What is this? Wh what is home all about? And so we, in our first year, um, home was the theme, and we 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 brought these uh, group of girls together, and uh, they went through an eight day uh, eight day uh, program of eight different workshops, and then on the, on the final day, uh, the girls with the help of our teacher facilitators, created a, a totally, um, I mean, crafted within the within the within the workshops uh, a performance based on home. So, um, in a nutshell, that's what it is. It's, it starts with uh, um, an, a workshop on creative writing. This is kind of where we start them out. You know, it's internal. It's writing. You you get your ideas out onto the page, and once they're out onto the page, the next workshop. Everything is scaffolded 
it scaffolded in, in this way so that the next workshop it's about interviewing and what's been written on the page is now um, is is embodied through voice right mm. and then in the third interview we we mix it up and have fun and do a music project where um, some of the some of the pieces that have been written or interviewed about find their way into lyrics of a song and we have a professional um, musical engineer in their recording and leading a song making workshop mm -hmm. and then the fourth day uh, there's uh, we, we really extrapolate on sound and get into um, Foley arts for example how to make a scene a, a sound with what happens behind the scenes of a, of, a, of a scene that we watch in a movie and so the girls uh, decide on a th uh, again, all based on what we've talked about in terms of home, they create a scene and then all the sound and foley arts for that. Hmm. And so we just we just build from workshop to workshop, and by the end, um, really what we're focusing on is performing our identities, right? And that's I teach a, a workshop. It's one of the final ones before we direct the before we direct the theater piece is um, is all on what does it mean and what does it look like and what can it look like to perform yourself to, you know what i mean yeah wow <laughs> yeah so yeah and then on the final day we invite a bunch of folks and friends and families and people from the community to come and watch this performance wow yeah. in in that performance setting is it is it common for there to be community performances or is this a, a unique uh, experience for for those who participate. Uh, it's I think it's pretty unique for Slovenia, having um, more of a traditional. I mean, not that it's a traditional society. There's a lot of avant garde and interesting uh, subcultures in terms of theater and um, and play and performance. Um, but this the inquiry part, like we these girls performed themselves as authentically as 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 ever by the end of the workshop and we just pull it out. We're just extracting and eliciting yeah. and, and, and teaching various techniques along the way. That is so and cool. I think in that sense, it is unique. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that's, that's brilliant. Are, are there other examples of, of, uh, workshops and, and experiences you've, uh, you've put together through the program? Through OSPA? Mm -hmm. Uh, no, actually, I ended up leaving Slovenia not too long after we did the pilot. Um, but we did get linked up with our, our core team. There's three of us. Uh, one, one gal who's been living in Slovenia for a long time. She's originally from Macedonia. And uh, another colleague from Canada and then me, an American. So we're a, a <laughs> multicultural bunch and... Um, uh, coming from various places and we all three of us have kind of left the orbit <laughs> <laughs> and um but but we did just before i left we got connected with the school of social work at the university of ljubljana mm -hmm. uh, and got to go and do a lecture and a, and a sort of mini version of the of the ospa workshops with students who are uh, learning about various methods of youth work and that was really cool for us mm. to go do so it's after the pilot yeah we kind of got more into um doing workshops for yeah university students and other lecturing mm -hmm. so, so what are your interests from here you've you've had uh many many adventures before and after all of this where where do you go next Oh God, you know that's a question I I'm still asking myself. I I I'm back in Portland after uh, being away for seven years, and uh, this last seven years included the most sort of the biggest pivot points of my life in terms of my profession. And one thing that I feel like um, for all the experience I've had and all the places I've been and the people I've met and the projects I've done, one thing that's lacking is um, is is time in time in terms of uh, uh, consistency and time in one specific place, a place to culminate and bring this all back. And right now, 
I mean, moving back to Portland represents that for me. Um, coming back here, I want to put this energy to use, but I want it to be more consistent and less project based. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm just, yeah, I'm hoping that that the next that the next thing that I do isn't just an iteration of what I've been doing before necessarily and not necessarily um, uh, a building block for something better or bigger, but more consistent. That's what I'm looking for. If somebody is interested in learning more about these these constructs, the, the, the role of uh, learning through these sorts of experiences so heavily founded in the arts, where can somebody start down that path today, the layman, if you will? Yeah, well, I would start with um, an educational philosopher, a female educational philosopher who was incredibly inspiring to me, who is no longer with us, but her work is all over the place. So you can mac- you can Google her name and start reading about um, her ideas. And her name is Maxine Green. It's G-R-E-E-N-E. And Maxine's uh, specifically uh, focus on, you can type in her name and then social imagination. Okay. And we'll be sure to link to this on the uh, notes page yeah. as well. That would be a great place to start. She's, she's really one of the pioneers and was a student of John, De- of John Dewey. And so, so was my thesis advisor at Teachers College, both students of John Dewey. So the experience and education are um, interconnected. And they're not mutually exclusive ever to these two women. That's what I love about them. That's why I'm, I'm so thankful I got to study under both of them. But um, so for me, I think it starts with um, with the history and theory that that edu- education uh, is is absolutely it absolutely necessitates experience if it's going to be functional and lasting, and and arts. Are, are a great vehicle for that. Arts uh, are, are a great vehicle for bringing experience into the classroom. So anyway, Maxine Green, her work is, is more focused on museum education and inquiry-based methods, uh, whereas my thesis advisor, her name is Hope Leichter. That's L-E-I-C-T, sorry, L-E-I-C-H-T-E-R. Uh, both focus on experience and education, and there are others out there. But I think it really, uh, in our modern modern age, those two women are, are should be at, at the beginning and top of everyone's reading list. Outstanding. Yeah. Nathaniel Andrini, thank you so much for your time. This is a fascinating. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's a fascinating world. It's a, it's fascinating to think about the the role of education in direct community outreach and uh, the, using using art as a way not only to express ourselves from the inside out, but to actually better connect with each other. And uh, I think we've got a long way to go in terms of how we incorporate technology into that, which has a, uh, a certain way of uh, isolating us at times. It's so easy to disappear True. into our phone, you know. Yeah, uh, and so that with the great hope of of uh, virtual experiences, one of one of the the highest of hopes being to bring people together and and to help uh, learners better better engage, uh, further mm-hmm. participate, uh, and embody that experience in a much more literal way than um, than we've been able to to this point in human history. Um, I think these non-technology assisted examples are a really good start in terms of how how to be thinking about it and and what's important and what the motivation behind all of this really can be yeah absolutely well um, thanks for having me on the show and uh, i'd like to say to anyone who's out there if you want to collaborate hit me up perfect where can we find you online you can find me online on i think i'll i think let's go with linkedin LinkedIn it is. And of course, we'll link there uh, as, yeah. as well. Um, for those that are not on the uh, the website right now, you can find uh, Nathaniel uh, at linkedin.com slash IN. 
And then his name is spelled N-A-T-H-A-N-A-E-L-A-N-D-R-E-I-N-I. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> you can also check out uh, openspaceperformingarts.org. Absolutely. Like. Absolutely. Like. I would like, and I Alrighty. will. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, thank you again so much, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing where all this leads from here. Thanks, man. Have a good one. All right. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks. Bye. New School VR is graciously supported by and recorded live at Concordia University in beautiful Portland, Oregon. For over 100 years, Concordia has been preparing teachers and learning professionals for life and for a living. For more information, visit cu-portland.edu. And by dot dot dash, an experiential design and technology studio specializing in custom virtual reality and experiential marketing activations that incite wonder and inspire action. See more at dot dot dash dot io. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or through your favorite podcast delivery app. Visit us online at newschoolvr.com. And thanks for listening. I'm your host, Pinky Gonzalez, and this is New School VR. This VR po- podcast is dope.